Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Axiom Games, LLC, proudly brings to you its development diary number seven. Hi, guys. I think it's number seven. I hope it's number seven. Listen, back in the shirt today, I do want to say this is going to be a smaller development diary, mainly because I don't have a ton to tell you right now. We are head deep in editing the original document, trying to get that sucker done, uh, trying to get a prototype in our hands before mid-July so that we can then set a release date. But I don't want to miss a day. I don't want to miss a development diary for you guys. And I do have a couple of things to talk about, and I thought we could do some more deep dives into the system. Number one, here's the big announcement. Here's the big announcement. And I know I've been hinting this on many different places where you see me, but it's finally happening. Upper Hand Wrestling, UHW, we are going to do a live play of this game starting sometime late July. Sometime mid-July, we will start posting episodes of it. I'm super excited about this. It also will showcase the versatility of the game, especially since not even everybody is going to be in the same room at the same time. Uh, so this is going to be really exciting. Uh, but yeah, we're going to put together some live play shows for you uh, of Upper Hand and Upper Hand Wrestling League. I've got a few players. Uh, it's going to be five, including me. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to do this. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very excited to announce it. Uh, it's, it's just going to be a ball. It's just going to be a ball. Our first episode will uh, begin starting the tournament to decide the first ever champion. And, uh, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. This is a live play game that I have been, uh, this is a dream of mine to get a live play game of a wrestling game out there. So, very excited that this is the one. Uh, plus, you guys out there, if you're considering buying this, purchasing this, maybe you're on the fence, you'll be able to watch us play, see the fun we're having. Maybe that pushes you over the edge to uh, make that purchase. Or maybe you just like watching us. That's totally fine. We're, we're all for it. It's definitely going to be on the Axiom Games LLC uh, YouTube as well as the Facebook. And who knows, might post it to Old Man Gaming too, just for shits and giggles. Uh, and let's face it, also because I have 323 subscribers on the Old Man Gaming one, I have six on the Axiom Games. So, uh, so yeah, so that should be launching sometime mid to late July next month. Very excited. I don't have a release date for you yet. We are just finished booking the, the first show. We are doing scheduling. Everybody's adults with many of us with children and wives and jobs and so we gotta schedule it. We gotta schedule everything out, but and I wanna make sure that we have enough recorded that I can actually make a few episodes so we could stay ahead for you guys. Uh so yeah. So it should be a lot of fun. A lot of fun for that. Um okay. That out of the way. Let's talk a little system for a few minutes. Let's have a little fun. So today, I want to talk a little bit about two things. Uh, modifications, and specifically one kind of modification, that is hardcore. Look, I just watched Slammiversary. Monsters Ball between Moose and Sammy Callahan was a bloodthirsty, crazy, awesome match. Uh, and let's face it, wrestling has a lot of hardcore stuff from the days of Mick Foley, Terry Funk, uh, you know, all the big names of hardcore uh, Nick Gage, the deathmatch psychopath, you know. Um, with that being said, there's got to be some violence in this. There's got to be some nasty, nasty weapon shots, some some hard stuff. We got to have that. How does that factor into the card based play? Well, let's let's talk a little bit about that. But first, we got to talk about modifications. Now, modifications when you're declaring the move after you placed it. So you place the moves down, you've got all your five out, and then you're going through the moves to resolve them. Uh, there's the declaration phase, which happens, you know, right before you flip. And basically you declare whether it's a signature, you declare what, what type of move it is, but you can also declare a modification. Modifications are things that modify the move's specific effects or damage for higher risk to the player themselves. So first, there's, of course, the high risk. High risk modification. That's where your wrestler is doing a move off the top rope or off a springboard or uh, something like that. Something big and flashy where if they hit, they do extra damage, but if they miss, they take extra damage. And depending on the height of the move, which we're going to talk about now, uh, such as top rope or turnbuckle, that would be a plus three damage on hit, but you get a plus one damage on a miss. A ladder, which is significantly higher, would be a plus four damage and a plus two on this. A cage would be a plus six damage, but 
plus three on miss, and so on and so forth. You guys get it. Uh, basically, uh, meaning that you're trying for that extra damage, but if you miss it, you're taking extra damage yourself. You're risking it all to do some serious damage to your opponent. Uh, then, of course, the next one is Double Team. Double Team is an interesting modifier because, uh, and, and I think maybe next show we'll talk about tag team stuff because we haven't really talked about tag team stuff. It is in the game, um, and there is ways to play it, and I think we'll talk about it next week. But Double Team is when two wrestlers team up on one to do one maneuver of heavy damage. A lot of a, these can even be tag team signatures. I mean... You talk about the Dudley's 3D. Uh, that's obviously a huge one. Or the Good Brothers Magic Killer. Like, there are a lot of big... Oh, or, heck, the old school guys and the Doomsday Device. Uh, so you got uh, uh, you got a lot of different double team signature maneuvers that can go off here. Uh, with that being said, how double team works is very interesting. Uh, only one person has to have a double team signature or call for a double team maneuver but they have to have a willing participant another wrestler has to be like yeah I'll go in on that with you the second wrestler doesn't do anything the first wrestler plays the card the first wrestler decides the move all that stuff however if it hits spotlessly they do their combined total damage so if the other person if there's no tie spot involved and you just beat them out right you will do so if it's a power move uh, you would do your power plus the wrestler helping use power, so huge damage. If it is a tie spot, then you take the higher stat with a plus one bonus. So, like if the second guy that you added to help you asked to help you has a four power and you have a three power, you use the four power and then you add plus one. Still big damage in in a game where you're going from one to ten on the KO values. Now, then if you miss though. Both of the wrestlers take the damage from the other opponent. So both wrestlers get hurt by one maneuver. Uh, so it's it's a tricky trade-off, again. Um, but in the same case, uh, that's how double team works, and that, that I think it works perfectly in this. Uh, but now, let's talk about the hardcore. Let's get violent, ladies and gentlemen. So there's two ways to use hardcore weapons in this. One is as a modification, and this is basically think of like doing a maneuver through a table, doing a maneuver onto a chair, doing a maneuver onto the oh-so-painful-looking tax. Uh, you know, the big hardcore stuff. Uh, that's a modification. Uh, then there's equipping a weapon and just wailing somebody with it. There's two ways, two ways to use a weapon. So first, a wrestling action has to be used to grab a weapon and bring it into play, period. Whether it be folding chair or tax or whatever. You gotta look under the ring, you gotta go knock somebody off a chair, you gotta go pull out a table and set it up, whatever. But a wrestling action is pretty open, so it could be a whole, like, I set it up, I equip it, I get back in the ring sort of situation. That being said, once it's in the rings, things get interesting. So let's say you decide to use it as a modification. Now you're talking some big damage here. So e each weapon that can be used as a modification uh, usually adds damage and or effects to whatever move you're doing, but the maneuver's effects and damage also already hit, which is pretty big. I mean, you can really zero somebody out by putting them through a table or suplexing them onto a chair. That being said though, the downside of this is way bigger than the high risk because if you're using a weapon as a modification, since you don't have to have it equipped at all, if you get reversed, or <clears throat> I'm sorry, if you get beaten, you take all that extra damage and effect yourself. So whatever the table is, whatever the table does to you, you take to yourself, in addition to the opponent's move. So basically, it's a risk it to get the biscuit sort of situation. You really have to beat their their card. You have to you have to knock it out. Uh, in that way, though, there is an the alternate way is to equip the weapon and use it. Now, when you're equipping a weapon, you have no <clears throat> real uh, uh, danger of it getting reversed into you. That being uh, well, other than if your opponent plays an actual reversal card. Uh, but if somebody beats you, they don't necessarily immediately get to use the damage against you. However, you don't get to use a move with it. Instead, you say, I'm going to use my equipped weapon in the declaration phase instead of picking an actual move type. 
Uh, and then you use the equipped version on each one. of Each one of the weapons have modified and equipped, and if they don't have one, they can't be used in that manner. You use that weapon, and then that weapon does the damage and effects and whatever it is to the least damaged KO value. And you use, of course, the card that you played as the, da the base damage that's added to the weapon. So that can also get pretty damaging. However, if your opponent beats you spotlessly, they can actually choose to take the weapon away from you and use it instead of whatever move they did to you. Interesting, interesting. And if you get beaten in any way, shape, or form, you drop the weapon, unless you have some ability that makes it impossible for you to do so. And once a weapon is dropped and it's in the ring, it's good to go as long as its durability holds out. Every weapon has a durability factor. That's how long it takes the weapon to break or be otherwise unusable by the wrestler. Uh, once that durability is gone, you can't use the weapon anymore, meaning you'll have to go get another one or whatever. Now, uh, yeah, so things get real, real violent. And I know I'm going a little bit over, but I want to actually talk to you about the bleeding effect, because let's face it, everybody likes the bleeding in wrestling. You want to say you don't, but you do. You do. It's always more interesting when it bleeds. Bleeding is really fun and really interesting in this. It's a very interesting status effect that you can actually add to just straight up signature maneuvers if you think they're violent enough. Uh, weapons and even some brutal moves can sometimes cut the opponent open, forcing them to bleed. A wrestler that is busted open can become exhausted and more vulnerable to attacks as it's going on. The first time the wrestler is hit with an attack that has a bleed effect in a round, they must make a cut saving throw. The saving throw is based on the total level of bleed effects added together. They, have then, they then have to roll a percentile uh, to get over the number in order to not be cut. If they roll under, they are cut and bleeding. So an example of that is like you're hitting somebody with a chair that has a 15 bleed, uh, or, or, or even you're, you're using a chair to modify a maneuver that has a 15 bleed, and the chair itself has like a 15 bleed, that's actually a 30% chance they're going to get cut open and bleed. That's their saving throw they've got to beat. Uh, in, if the wrestler fails their cut saving throw, they will begin bleeding in the following round. Finish the round as normal with the cards that are out, because blood just doesn't spurt out of the head, not usually. Uh... Then the round will begin with the effect on the victim. Each round of bleeding has a different effect. Each effect will last for one round. The wound also can stop bleeding or slow depending on the level of the wound. This is based on the amount the victim failed the cut save by. So if you failed the cut save by 1 to 10, you just opened up. You got a little cut. There's some blood coming out. Uh, if you're 11 to 20 you failed by, then you are, it's dripping wound. You're really, you've got some blood. It's starting to pool. And 21 to 30 is a mask of red. This is a wrestling terminology where their face is just covered in their own blood. Uh, you cannot open someone up for more than a mask of red, regardless of the results of the cut save. So if the character failed by 5, they are just opened up which means the following round they will use that modifier when and then at and then after as long as they were not reopened the bleeding effect will stop and the bleed the blood slowly clots and it stops bleeding if they were hit with say 15 if they were safe for 15 then they would use the opening up for the first round and the dripping wound for the second meaning like let's say you you get the dripping wound, so it starts as dripping, then it becomes an open, then it goes away because of the clotting. It's how open your wound is. Uh, and the wounds can be reopened during the bleeding period. Uh, in this case, the effects start over once the final round of the previous bleed elapses. Uh, so, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to what the effects are. Uh, Opened up means that the open wound will make incoming da damage more effective. The victim takes a plus one damage from all sources. A dripping wound, however, uh, it means that the blood loss is starting to affect the victim's exhaustion level, making it harder to keep up. They cannot start the round with upper hand, nor can they receive it throughout. 
which is rough. You have to be in lower hand if you've got a Dripping Wound until it's resolved. And then a Mask of Red means the blood is freely flowing into the eyes of the wrestler, making it hard for the wrestler to see in order to do their maneuvers or reverse them. During this round, the wrestler cannot win tie saves. Only reversals and spotless moves will connect. So you see how it affects the wrestler in different ways. And if you were Mask of Red for that first round, then you'd be dripping, which means that you just can't receive upper hand throughout, and then you'd be taking that plus one damage. So they don't necessarily stack. It's the effect as it slowly bleeds off. Uh, so yeah, so there you go. There's there's hardcore. There's a look into hardcore in the game and how that works. I think maybe next week we'll, we'll look at tag teams. Uh, we've got not only tag team rules, but tornado tag rules. I'm very excited about because the tornado tags might be a basis for future games from this company that's way too early to talk about that so we'll just we'll just pretend I didn't say it uh, and other than that keep an eye out for not only our game but our show it's gonna be coming soon in July we're very excited about it and uh, I want to thank everybody who's helping me with it so yeah so here we go that's it comment below any questions you have anything you want to ask me anything you want me to touch on in the show I'd love to answer them I'd love to respond to them and uh, until next week We'll see it. We'll see you then.